Jesus said, if you keep my commands, you will abide in my love. When we hear the word command, most of us think of something restrictive. The truth is, the commands of Jesus don't restrict us. They bring us freedom and joy. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? My name is Joe. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ the Rock, and it's my privilege to be speaking with you this morning. It's been a while since I've been up here, and I'm glad to be up here with you again. Today we're going to be talking about the last one of, seven, of the seven basic commands of Jesus, which was to go and make disciples. And I just want to ask you, you know, have you ever been a part of an organization? Maybe it's where you work or when you started a new job or a degree that you were studying where there was this vocabulary that was used in that environment that you just had to figure out. And people would throw terms around and you didn't really know what they meant, but you kind of had to pretend that you did in order to fit in there. Uh, I was in the Army for a long time, and we could have entire conversations and just acronyms with each other. Um, and if you don't know them, you know, you're kind of lost. <laughs> and disciple and discipleship can be kind of two of those terms that are used inside churches, but they're not really used anywhere else. And unless someone kind of takes the time to explain and unpack that with you, you may not know exactly what they mean. So I'm excited to share with you this morning a little bit of my story and some instructions straight from Jesus' words that talks to us about what does it mean to be a disciple. And I've been praying all week long that this message will inspire you and encourage you in your own walk with the Lord. You know, as I mentioned, I've been in the Army. I was on active duty for about 14 years, and it was 12 years into my time in service when I deployed to Iraq. And up until that point, I'd had all the usual assignments that an Army officer has, and I loved them. I really loved being in the Army. I enjoyed it so much. But it was really, really difficult after 9-11 to be in the Army and be stateside while your country was at war and all my peers were overseas. I needed to be in the game. And eventually my number came up, and it was my turn, and I deployed. And when I deployed to Iraq, something happened. For the first time in my career, I was asked to start working on some classified projects for the Defense Department. And I'd never done that before. And it exposed me to a side of the military and the U.S. government that I knew absolutely nothing about. It was just a side of it that I had you know, heard existed, but I didn't really know what was behind that curtain. And I'd always wondered, what would it be like to look on the other side of that curtain and see, to be a part of this kind of secret squirrel world uh, behind the curtain there? And my eyes got to be blown wide open. When you come on board to a top secret or secret project, you have to be what's called read on to the project. And read on means that someone is going to take you to a secure location, into a building that's shielded against electromagnetic interference. No cell phone signals can come in or out. And they take you into this glorified vault, and then someone opens up the book, and they start talking to you, and they share with you what the secret plan is all about. And then they tell you what your role is inside that secret plan. And I remember the first couple of times that this happened, I was just literally dumbfounded and awestruck and what these projects and initiatives contained. I mean, I was so proud of our country and these people that developed these things. I was just like, my jaw was on the floor as I was brought on board these things. And I said to myself, like, where has this been all my career? This is the part of the military that I've been missing. I'd never known that this existed, and this is the person that I want to be. I want to be all about this. And you know what? Uh, that's exactly like discipleship. You and I may have heard the term disciple and discipleship. Maybe you know a little bit about that world. But for most of us, we've never really been read on to God's plan to save the world and win the war against evil because no one's ever explained to you what's behind this curtain. This, and I want to tell you today that behind the curtain of discipleship is this whole other rewarding part of life that you may not know has even existed because someone's never explained it to you. And I'm excited to be with you this morning to get to explain some of that. And the great thing about discipleship is, is you don't have to be a part of some secret agent Christian or it's not just for a few select people. It's actually Jesus' plan for every single one of us. 
So maybe you're here in church this morning and you've been a part of Christ the Rock for a long time. And maybe you're asking yourself, isn't making disciples, isn't that the work of the staff or the pastors? I don't know if I feel qualified to do something like that. Or maybe you can recall a specific moment in the course of your life where you made a decision for Jesus. But if you're honest, not much in your life has changed since. Others of you may th- be thinking that walking with Jesus really isn't much of an adventure at all because the sum expression of your Christianity is participating in some religious practices that you and I both know have very little impact in your life. And you're asking yourself, is this all there is to it? And lastly, you know, maybe others of you, you want to do more with your life and you want to do more with your faith. And you're wondering, like, is there a place on God's team for me? Is there room for me to get in the game? And I believe that this message is going to give you fresh insight into God's Word, His kingdom purpose for your life, and your role in His secret plan. And to get answers for some of these questions that you may have, we've got to ask ourselves, what exactly did Jesus say about the gospel and discipleship? Because once we begin to understand that discipleship is Christ's plan to love the world through you. Then we're on to something that is going to truly change your view of what it means to be a Christ follower forever. Truly. I mean, God himself said, Jesus said it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loved the world. He sent Jesus. Jesus chose disciples, and he told those disciples to go and make disciples. That's God's plan to love the world through each one of us. And so there's this moment in Jesus' life after his death, burial, and resurrection that he is about to ascend back into heaven, and he's with his disciples. These are the guys that have been with him the whole journey. They've suffered together, they've learned together, they've done miracles together, and Jesus loved them, and they were friends with Jesus. And this is the last conversation that Jesus is going to have to them, eyeball to eyeball, face to face, until they saw him again in in eternity. And Jesus could have said absolutely anything that he wanted to them in this moment, and he chose to say what I'm about to share with you on the screen. It's fascinating to me. Jesus came to his disciples, and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That was his last words to them. And we see Jesus here. He's talking to his disciples, and he's saying like, You guys are my disciples. I want you to go and make more disciples all over the world, just like I've been doing with you. So if that's Jesus' instructions to his disciples to go make more disciples, probably a place for us to start this morning would be to look at the gospel of Jesus and find out what he wanted the disciples of that gospel to actually look like, right? Uh, So for that, let's look in the book of Mark. And we're going to explore a little bit more here. You know, the book of Mark is given to us because it focuses on what the gospel is all about. In fact, the very first words of the book of Mark is this. It says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What a powerful statement. Mark was written for us to know that what follows in this book is God's explanation for everything about the gospel. And so Mark chapter 1 begins with Jesus being baptized. He was led to the wilderness to be tempted for a period of 40 days. And then when he returned from that time of temptation, Jesus comes back and he opens his mouth about the gospel for the very first time. And then this is what Jesus had to say about it. It says, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. I wish we had time to do a series on the kingdom of God arriving in this phrase that the time is fulfilled. There's so much meaning there to unpack. But suffice it to say for right now, the arrival of the kingdom of God 
Jesus was reading the people on to his plan to save the world. He's saying the time to restore the world to the rule and reign of God the Father has begun, and it's being launched through me, and I'm going to spread it to my disciples. And in Mark chapter 8, Jesus goes on to unpack even more what this gospel of his actually meant. This is what he said in Mark chapter 8. Jesus asked his disciples, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. So in this Mark chapter 1 verse, and this Mark chapter 8 passage here, we see Jesus tell us four things about the gospel. He says the kingdom of God is at hand, and then he affirms Peter when Peter says, You are the Christ, and the Christ means you're the promised Messiah that we've been waiting for all these years, and you are the king of God's kingdom. He said that I'm going to suffer and die for the sins of the world, and then he said after three days, I'm going to rise up again. And I would bet that every person in this room knows most of what I just explained. And I would bet if you went out uh, into society, you could ask a lot of people, like, you know, what do you know about Jesus? And they would say several of those things. But what I want to ask you this morning is, have you ever stopped to ask yourself, what did Jesus himself say was the response that he wanted to this gospel? Because that's where all the seven commands that we've been studying begin to tie together perfectly. Let's look again at what Jesus said and a little bit that followed this to see the response that Jesus wanted. So when Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, he said, repent, believe in the gospel. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. That's the response. Does that sound like the gospel that you've heard? And more importantly... Have you responded to this gospel the way that Jesus has said to respond? Through repent, believe, and follow Jesus. You know, I came to a point in my own life, I grew up in church. I used to joke that, you know, I was born in the church nursery. I've been in church my entire life. And I came to a point in my life where I had realized that I had primarily been taught about what some people call the forgiveness-only gospel. It means that, you know, if you express faith in Jesus, you'll be forgiven of your sins, which is true. But even though I've been in church my entire life, I had heard very little about this expectation of Jesus to actually repent of our sins and to follow Him every day of our life. And so as I was a young believer and had my issues growing up and stuff, I just, I couldn't explain why I, because I believed in Jesus, why I believed in Jesus, and yet simultaneously I was enslaved in so many areas of my life. It really felt distorted to me. And this kept happening. It felt incomplete. And this was only reinforced over the period of my life as I was a believer in churches and in the military. I moved from church to church to church, and I saw it all the time. And I've seen Hundreds of people come forward and express a decision in Jesus only to see many, many of them just disappear and fall away or never mature from there. And I'm asking myself, why is this? What's missing? So I want to share some insight with you. You know, few churches today proclaim this gospel of repent, believe, and follow Jesus. I'm thankful that this is one of them. But even fewer churches call people to a lifestyle of being a disciple of Jesus and becoming a disciple maker, just like Jesus did and what Jesus instructed his disciples to do. And so we've got to ask ourselves, how in the world did this happen when Jesus himself laid out something so different? Here's a little piece of church history for you. You know, before TV and radio in America, if you go back further in time, the first celebrities were traveling evangelists. And these traveling evangelists, they would travel the country, they would go to a town or a city, and they would set up these huge circus tents, I mean like big enough to fit all of us inside of them. And masses of people would come and listen to these traveling evangelists. And as the traveling evangelists would speak, 
then the people would respond. And in the 1820s, there was a popular traveling evangelist by the name of Charles Finney. And Charles Finney, he wanted a more visible response from people when he would preach. And so he began preaching these really long sermons, and they were very intense, fire and brimstone kind of messages. And then at the end of them, he would create this sense of urgency, and he would want people to get up out of their seats and walk forward. And it was called the altar call. And that was one of the first times that this practice began. And prior to the 1820s, this was not a practice among churches and with evangelists. In fact, in 1750s, during what was called the Great Spiritual Awakening in Europe and the Americas, there was a revivalist by the name of George Whitfield. And George Whitfield also traveled and taught these amazing messages and was a gifted speaker. But he knew that responding to Jesus was far more than this momentary response. In fact, somebody once asked him after he preached, he said, how many people became Christ followers after your message? And he said, I don't know. We should know more in about six months. He knew that that was different. But other evangelists, another one of them by the name of Reverend Billy Sunday. Man, if you're going to be a, an evangelist, Billy Sunday is the name to have, right? <laughs> but this other evangelist by the name of Billy Sunday, he would have these same kind of tent revival meetings and hold to hold the noise down underneath the tent and to keep the dust at bay. He would cover the floors underneath the tent with sawdust. And then as he would preach... He would tell people to get up out of your chair and hit the sawdust trail and come forward. And though there's nothing wrong with coming forward as part of a worship service, nothing at all, many of your faith journeys began with that step right there. Uh, mine did too. But nonetheless, this passing of evangelism, driving to this point of this momentary decision, created some unintended consequences that the church today has to wrestle with to raise up the kind of disciples that Jesus called us to raise up. I just want to share a few of those consequences with you. Number one, it created the impression in these mass audiences that the goal of a believer who wasn't in ministry was to get people to the audience so that they could hear the professional speak. And so people began to believe that the gospel has to be delivered by a professional. The focus began to shift from teaching the full gospel of repent and believe and follow Jesus to a culmination point of saying, just express your belief by saying this sinner's prayer or raising your right hand and repeating after me. And it left many people saying, I don't feel qualified to do much more than just listen to the professional up there on stage. This is not how Jesus intended it to be. An author that I respect wrote this little phrase. He said, Jesus started the church the way he wanted it. Now he wants the church the way he started it. This focus on these kind of like momentary decision things separated something that God never intended to be separated. And that was the process of conversion and discipleship. They go together and yet this began to separate and so here's the effect that we had. Little by little, people came to believe that a person can be saved while simultaneously thinking that following Jesus and repenting is actually optional. They came to believe that not only is following Jesus optional, but only a few people have called to actually be disciples and much less make disciples. And little by little, getting people to come to Christ and become a convert to Christianity became the focus as the finish line of responding to Jesus, not the starting point. Let me say that again. Little by little, this kind of teaching of getting people to come to Christ and become a convert to Christianity became to be seen as the finish line of Christian teaching, not the starting point of a life of being a disciple and being a disciple maker. It shouldn't be that way. So let's look again at what Jesus said when he invited his first two disciples to come after him. Scripture says that as Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Let's break that down for a second, okay? I want you to understand this story. You know, right now when we kind of think of Peter... We think of like, this is the guy, man. This is the guy that was one of the two major founders of the early church. That he died for Jesus. He died for his faith. 
Uh, but Peter wasn't always that way. And when Jesus met Peter and Andrew here by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus was looking at two lost people, people who were bound for hell in that moment. And I want you to understand something here. We'll come back to this in just a second. But the invitation that Jesus gave to them is our definition of disciple here. It's Jesus' definition, actually. Here's what it says. Um, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. So a disciple then, according to this passage, is Jesus saying, follow me. So a disciple is someone that is following Jesus. Jesus said, I will make you. And that means that Jesus is changing people. So a disciple is someone that's following Jesus, being changed by Jesus. And then Jesus said, if you allow me to change you, I will make you become a fisher of men. And fishers of men are people that make other disciples. And so Jesus is saying, a disciple of mine is someone who follows me, is being changed by me, and they get on board with my mission to make disciples of the entire world, to love them as I'm loving them. And so when we say that a disciple of Jesus is someone that is following Jesus, here's what that means. You know, we say that you've got to believe in Jesus. Well, following Jesus is the expression of belief. You know, if I said there's a pallet of gold bricks in the parking lot, and they're free, all you got to do is take one. If you actually believed what I said, right, you would express that belief by trampling each other to get out the door to the parking lot, right? Uh, you'd have to be me. So that's belief. Following Jesus is actually the expression of belief. It's putting that belief into action. And there's something else that following Jesus expresses, and that's repentance. Scripture tells us that sin is darkness and that Jesus is the light. And Scripture tells us that light and darkness have no fellowship together. So when I'm following Jesus, the light, I'm simultaneously repenting because I'm moving away from darkness. And He changes my heart as we do that. But somewhere along the way, in Western Christianity, this kind of belief that Jesus described being expressed through action got confused with asking people to say, do you believe this set of facts about Jesus? Do you realize, do you agree that Jesus is who he says he is, that he died on his cross for your sins and he rose again? But Scripture tells us that even the demons believe that and they tremble when they think about it. In fact, just a few verses after Jesus invites his disciples to follow him, Jesus encounters a demon-possessed man, and I want to share with you what the demon cried out to Jesus in his presence. This demon said, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I believe that God gave us this example right after he gave this description of what a disciple is to repent, believe, and follow. God gave us this example of this demon-possessed man to show us that mere agreement with a set of facts about the identity of Jesus isn't the kind of belief that Jesus is asking for. Jesus is asking for belief that is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit compels us to respond to Jesus in the way that Jesus desires. And it's the Holy Spirit that actually empowers us to do what Jesus has called us to do. And so the life of a believer was intended by Jesus to be this continual process of follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, commit deeper to the mission of Jesus. Churches were never, ever meant to be filled with spectators. Jesus intended every single one of us to be out of the stands, on the field, in the game, making disciples of the world. And that brings us back to Jesus' last words to his disciples. Let's look at it one more time. Jesus came and said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is commanding us to go, and he wants us to step up to the people who are 
in our world, at our workplace, in our schools, our friends, and our family, and have the same vision for the people that we meet that Jesus had when he met Peter and Andrew. Not just a vision of get saved and avoid hell, but a vision for their life to say that God has a kingdom purpose for your life. God wants you to follow him, to be changed by him, and then he wants you to commit to his mission and be part of the team that loves the world through you. That's his command. And the great news about this final command is that Jesus is with us when we actually do it. I want you to understand that the grace of God is what drew us to Jesus in the first place. Apart from that, we would not know the Father. But it's the same grace of God that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power of God through the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you if you belong to Jesus. And it's that same power of the Lord that energizes you and allows you and equips and speaks through you as you commit to the mission of Jesus. You're not on your own if you agree to do this. And you know what? It is so incredibly rewarding. It is so incredibly rewarding. You know, I thought at one point in time that secret projects and clandestine operations were the most rewarding part of my life that I'd been missing. And boy, was I wrong. It wasn't. You know, for those of you who don't know my story, my story is one of abuse as a child and some sexual trauma at a very young age, and I was exposed to pornography, and very quickly and early in life, I became addicted to sexual sin. And I struggled and struggled and struggled with that for decades. And you know what changed my life? Discipleship changed my life. God sent to me intentional leaders that drew me into relationship with other people like me, and they showed me truth. They gave me access to their life so that they could model new ways to live as we follow Jesus together, and they had me in this safe place with them that I could be fully known while being held accountable. And they shepherded me to a place of greater maturity so that I could move from my addiction into the kingdom calling that they had for my life. And they spoke truth over me as they said, the purpose of your life is not to stop acting out. The purpose of your life, Joe, is to be a disciple maker and to repeat this process over and over and over again until your dying breath. And I'm so passionate about discipleship because it's discipleship that God used to change my life. And though I am far from perfect... And I still struggle at times. My life, I can say with a clear conscience, is one of following Jesus, being changed by Jesus. And I am, as long as I stay in step with the Spirit, committed to the mission of Jesus in my life. One of the most rewarding things that I get to do is to be one-on-one in the trenches of someone else's life, battling with them as we follow Jesus together, or in this tiny little corner of the universe in the basement on Tuesday nights with other men and freedom fighters as we pursue this together. It's watching the power of God unfold in real time, and that's it for me. I'm all in. Discipleship is what was missing, and perhaps it's what's missing for you. You know, the God of the universe has invited you and read you on to his plan to change the world. I want to tell you about my son, Stephen. He's a high school junior right now. And like me, when I went to Iraq in his freshman year, he uncovered a whole new world that he didn't know existed prior to that. And that world was wrestling. And when he discovered wrestling, he was instantly hooked. You know, and for those of you who don't know about wrestling, wrestling is not for the faint of heart or the weak in spirit. And if you've never wrestled before and you start in high school, there's a very steep and painful learning curve. Some of these kids, my word, they've been wrestling ever since they came out of the womb. It'll test you mind, body, spirit, ego. And as a dad, I've been so proud of my son watching him get on the mat and wrestle. And I have learned so much about discipleship just by watching him in action. I almost titled today's message, Everything I Need to Know About Discipleship I Learned from Wrestling. I'd like to share a couple of thoughts with you on that. You can join a football team or a basketball team, and you can spend the entire season on the sidelines and never get in the game. 
Not so with wrestling. In wrestling, the coach has recruited you for one reason and one reason only, to get on the mat, wrestle, and score points for the team. And you can't learn wrestling from a lecture or by watching someone else do it. You have to be discipled in the art of wrestling by another wrestler who's more mature than you and further along, a wrestler who knows what life on the mat is like, who knows the skills and the techniques of wrestling. And no wrestler ever steps onto the mat alone. When you step onto the mat as a wrestler and you get on that mat, your coach, he grabs a chair and he sits down by the side of the mat. And while you're duking it out with the other guy, that coach is calling out instructions and encouragement to you to help you get the wind. You're not out there by yourself. And it's gritty and it's ugly. And these kids bleed all over the place. And when you start bleeding, it's the coach himself who leaves the chair, gets out on the mat and cleans you up and plugs you up, slaps you on the butt and gets you back on the mat to keep wrestling. And then when it's over, as a wrestler, you get off off the mat and your whole team has been rooting for you and they're high-fiving you and slapping you on the shoulder as you come off the mat, win or lose, because you had the courage to get on the mat in the first place. And I want to tell you that Jesus has done the same thing for all of us. Thank God that Jesus did not pursue us to be on his team just to spend the rest of our life sitting on the sidelines. God wants you to be on the mat, your mat, in your world, bringing others to come be with Jesus, to win for the kingdom of God with him. And we've got to follow Jesus and learn his ways as he's the master coach to teach us. And you need to know that you're not alone in this battle. God is seated on his throne And he's calling out to you all the encouragement and instructions you need to get the wind. And not just Jesus, but Scripture also tells us that all the saints who have gone before us since the beginning of time have formed this great cloud of witnesses that are cheering us on as we do it. So maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, or maybe you're older in life and you're looking back and you're thinking, man, I've wasted so much time. I've never been discipled. And I've never discipled someone else. And I just want to share with you some encouragement that it is not too late to get out there and get in the game and win for the kingdom. You know, one more thing about wrestling. In wrestling, when you're behind in the score and you're absolutely exhausted and you're discouraged and all that you're trying to do is just finish the match with some dignity without getting pinned. And it's agonizing to watch as a parent, but the coach will encourage you and look at you and tell you it's time to make your move and still score the wind. And when there's just about 20 seconds left in the match, he'll cup his heads and he'll say, short time, short time. And it means it's got, you've got to make your move because it's almost over. And Jesus is saying in the book of Revelation, he says, behold, I am coming quickly. You don't need me to tell you what the headlines say. Jesus is saying the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world. It's a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Jesus is calling out to you, and he's calling out to me and saying, it's not over yet, but it's short time, short time. Make your move and join me for the win. Church, we can be his disciples, and we can become disciple makers for the glory of God with the power of his spirit. So I just want to close by asking you, Have you responded to the gospel the way Jesus himself said to respond? How might your coach want you to respond today? Are you in the stands? Are you on the sidelines? Are you in the game? Are you ready to get in the game? Because the gospel of Jesus commands a response from us. Will you pray with me? Father, we love you, and you are brilliant in making your plan for the church of disciples, making disciples. It stands up against persecution. It stands up against bad economies. It stands up against leaders who fall. God, your church stands because it's your brilliant design. And God, you didn't ask us to just sit on the sidelines, but In your love for us, you want us to experience the reward of being a part of your kingdom plan to rescue the world from sin. Thank you for inviting us into that. And God, I'm I'm praying by your Spirit, you give us the courage and the conviction to move beyond where we are 
and to become greater followers of you that allows you to change us, that causes us to be committed to this mission of yours of making disciples all over the world. Lord, we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.